Okay, so we're going to just uh, jump right into things here this morning. So I'd like to um, start with our, our opening address, and so I will uh, make no further ado than uh, introduce Kim Stevens, the Executive Director of the Partnership for uh, Water Sustainability BC. Kim is uh, an engineer and a planner with more than four decades of experience in water resource uh, and infrastructure engineering. Um, so uh, yeah, please welcome to the stage Kim Stevens. Thank you, thank you Kim. And it was really great seeing that show of hands when you asked the question who was last here last night because that really does set the context for today. And you know in terms of what I'll talk to you about as soon as this comes up. So really, it's what happens on the land matters. And, and, and the reason I want to start with that phrase is because too often we talk about water and land as silos. But it's how we respect the land that really affects what happens with water. So that's kind of a key message. But part of my, you know, when being asked to, to kick this off was to really introduce you to the the theme or the, the branding, whatever you want to call it, of, of moving towards sustainable watershed systems through asset management. And I, and I wanted to kind of pr provide you with a personal perspective to kick this off in terms of the Comox Valley because it's actually been 10 years, a decade, that the partnership that we have been involved in, in supporting uh, this, this valley. And you know, um, this is one of my favorite photographs for use in presentations because some of you may recognize some of the people in this in this picture. You know, that's Kevin Lake, and I call it, call it the, the Pied Piper one. You'll see you'll see uh, uh, Glenn Westendorf. You'll see Martin Kymans of Comox. So there's a lot of familiar faces. But the context there was going back in 2007, and I see Jack Bernard in the back of the room. Hello, Jack. <laughs> uh, in 2007, the province and the Real Estate Foundation co-funded an initiative on Vancouver Island called CAPI, Convening for Action on Vancouver Island. And so in 2007, we asked the, well, the regional districts to partner with their uh, large municipalities. And that was the uh, beginning of, well, that year was the showcasing innovation series. So think back 10 years because uh, in terms of today, uh, this is a watershed moment. So the journey didn't start, doesn't start today. This is, you know, this is one step along the journey. And so I'm giving you this flashback to uh, my perspective on really what today is about celebrating and then celebrating the past 10 years and beyond that because I'm looking at Jack when I say before before that uh, the, the valley and then springboarding to the future because uh, what came out of out of in 2007 and bringing together local governments and uh, well I guess in 2008 was the release of, of, of Living Water Smart and that's how we began the Learning Lunch seminar series on Vancouver Island in the Comox Valley, and in the first year, in parallel with Cowichan Valley, I see Kate Miller of, of Cowichan Valley Regional District is here. So that was how we began to build the collaboration amongst local governments. And the significance of the Comox Valley was bringing the local governments together with the Comox Valley Land Trust. So in terms of the, what we call the cabbie table, you know, the people that were at a staff level being to work together to align, to align uh, efforts and, and collaborate and begin to work on a shared vision that you had that, that the stewardship sector was at the table. So in terms of this symposium, and I'll say we are, you are, we all are, are convening for action. <coughs> convening for action means what will you do differently when you leave this room today? But I also want to introduce three big ideas that provide a backdrop for the journey ahead because again, this is a journey. Today is one step on a journey. It's a pretty significant moment, but it's part of the journey. So, shifting baseline syndrome, whole system, water balance approach, cathedral thinking. Those will be the three thoughts that I hope you will leave this day in your head. This is the BC process for moving from awareness to action. This is what's guided us in terms of my responsibilities for delivering the Water Sustainability Action Plan for the last 15 years. And it's found on, you see there, alignment, collaboration, partnerships. In British Columbia, we have this unique model called top-down, bottom-up. And you know, I can reflect on my, my career perspective as an engineer. And you know, and my, my career has been defined by floods and droughts. And we often talk about the hydrological um, cycle because that means that once a decade, you have a flood. Once a decade, you have a drought. You write a report, you put it on the shelf, 
A decade later, you have a flood, you have a drought, you update the report, right? So in other words, we're very good at the what part. We're not so good at getting to, so what are we gonna do about it? So in terms of our process, which is the what, so what, now what, then what? Well, what is the issue? It's pretty basic if you, if you simplify your language. It's the form of land development. That's what impacts on how water is used, how water runs off the land, how water reaches streams. So if you keep that simple image in your head, it helps you think about, so what are we gonna do? Well, we're gonna influence practitioners to design with nature. And really that was the essence of what you heard last night, which is moving to, you know, not destroy nature, but to designing with nature. And so, you know, if we can influence, and if we can change the ethic, if we can have that land ethic, which becomes the water ethic, well then, now what can we do? And this is where we've been at in British Columbia. It's embracing shared responsibility. That's why you're all here today. That's why this, you know, folks, street keeper folks and others and local government folks are in this room because you're embracing shared responsibility. You learn by doing. In this valley, there's more than a decade of experience of learning by doing. And you establish precedence. The key is establishing precedence. Bob, is, it, is the sound okay in the back? Good. And so, once you establish the precedence, then you replicate in other communities. That's the BC approach, right? It's top, it's top down, bottom up. You need, you need to be empowered by a, by a framework, but it's on the ground. The Comox Valley, the Cowichan Valley, but in Lambert region, Julie Pisani's here. You do things, you share and you learn, and you replicate, and we work towards that, as Bob said last night, restorative development. So as we look back, you know, and what, what you heard a lot about yesterday was the legacy of past community planning and infrastructure servicing practices. What, what are we seeing? Floods and, floods and droughts, that's the new normal. And so really what it comes down to is the natural balance of watersheds is out of balance. And Bob said did such a great job of providing that global perspective of why the global water balance is out of balance. And if the global water balance is out of balance, then certainly the Comox Valley water balance is out of balance. And so, looking ahead, and you know, in terms of, uh, I was on, on uh, last November, Bob and I were part of the, uh, uh, the Flow and Grow workshop, which we did in the Okanagan. And my takeaway from Bob's presentation uh, that time was the notion of atmospheric rivers. And just to remind you what Bob said last night, a one degree rise in global temperature means you can, you know, the atmosphere, the vapor increased, you know, the water vapor increased by 7%, and we see that in terms of the impact of the Pineapple Express, in terms of the fact that we are at this moment of truth. So if I was to capture Bob's presentation last night, we are at a moment of truth, and time is of the essence. So, again, you saw this image last night, the December 14th flood, cause and effect, you know, the global change with the local impact. You know, it's it it it's not it's not a hopeful situation because you know we have been doing things, we have been learning, we have been uh, adapting, uh, doing different things. We have been making progress over the last ten years, and from I can tell you from a personal perspective, you know, it has taken us more than a decade. But in terms of British Columbia, we do have now a policy program and regulatory framework that makes it possible makes it possible to achieve water resilient communities. And so really, you know, in terms of the process of or what's happened in the last 10 years, three game changers took place in 2014. Yeah. The first one being the Water Sustainability Act was passed in, in, in May of 2014. The second one is Develop with Care. Uh, and really, Develop with Care is one that just has not got the profile that it should have in terms of being a, a game changer in terms of what, of what it accomplished. I think part of that is the fact that the champions behind it retired. And you do need to have champions. But the linchpin, the linchpin is asset management for sustainable service delivery, a framework for British Columbia. And it's really good to see Wally Wells in the crowd, uh, the executive director of asset management BC, because of the, of the significance and the importance of the BC framework, because the next step there is to actually integrate watershed systems thinking into asset management, and I will expand. And of course, on the right-hand side, you see the, the image of the, of the uh, BC framework covered. So a very significant document because it links, or it has the potential 
to influence behavior quite significantly in the world of global government because you know if you're applying for a grant now it's all key to compliance in effect that's the word to use compliance with the bc framework the first big idea that i want to introduce to you the sliding baseline syndrome and daniel Pauly, uh he's a he's a professor at ubc he's actually from france and he coined this in 1995 and he said to me um, it was it was one of those things where after a major conference and whoever was supposed to do the kind of the forward to the symposium uh, dropped the ball and they said, Daniel, can you do a, can you do something in terms of, a, of an introduction? And he said it was a think piece. And it was two pages. But he captured a way of thinking that's kind of taken a, a, a lot of a life of its own in terms of explaining in so many ways why it is that we allow things to progressively decline over time. And you know what you see here is you see on the on the, on the x-axis time. And as, as Daniel said, you see on the y-axis, they said, some good thing. And uh, I modified that by saying, okay, some good thing, that becomes your driver for action. But what he pointed out was that with each new generation, your view of the world is based on the world as you see it now. So those images now are in your head. So when change happens, one's perspective is in on the incremental differences from what you experienced. So you have no knowledge of what went before you. And he said, it's kind of ironic, right, that we transform the world and we have no knowledge from a personal basis of what the world was like. And so he was just trying to explain, you know, uh, the, just how ecological, the ecological baseline declines incrementally over time. <coughs> Picking up on what Bob said last night, our approach in British Columbia through the Water Sustainability Action Plan is to say, hey, we can make a difference. You know, but we have to think differently about how we develop on the land. And so the position, the, the experience, the tools that we're developing is really key to reversing things, to make things better, because communities can reset the ecological baseline. And the reason I personally, you know, why I, I, I've zeroed in on this image is because in 2014, uh, three of us uh, were invited to go across the country doing a national workshop series, and we needed a, we needed a slide which would kind of put in perspective why British Columbia was different to the rest of the country. And initially, I just thought, okay, it's just because we're at a different point on this on this decline. But what I realized by the time we finished up in Halifax was the difference in British Columbia was our connection to the landscape compared to the other provinces, and that we were actually doing things. And you know, the fall of 2014, there were some great things happening. And where's Tim right now? Because uh, and Tim, because what you, your background on the Campbell River, right? Because 2014 was big news when the, the salmon came back to Campbell River, right? Remember that was headline news? So that timing was coincidental with our going across the country. And there was, you know, there were sightings in terms of, um, of the orcas and, and, and in Howe Sound. And, and so uh, we had a good news story to be able to say, well, you know, we can't necessarily connect a lot of what we're doing, but the fact is something good is happening in British Columbia as the result of what's been going on for decades. And people said, you guys are lucky in British Columbia because you have those symbols. Just keep moving here, because 10 minutes. So it's really what we're saying in terms of where we're at now is looking at development differently. And here's the sound bite for you. To protect watershed health, engineered infrastructure, ought to fit into natural systems rather than the other way around. Think about that. I've intentionally included a photograph of a rain garden in an urban environment. So it's not a case of, in terms of a mindset, thinking about, well, we, we have a rain garden. We've solved the problems. It's the total mindset change in how we look at the landscape. Engineered infrastructure ought to fit into natural systems rather than the other way around. Mulled it over. So in terms of, of what I represent, in terms of the Partnership for Water Sustainability and our responsibility for delivering the Water Sustainability Action Plan through partnerships and collaboration, uh, very much bottom-up initiative, and sustainable watershed systems through asset management being the branding for what we're trying to accomplish to change the way people think. And we've commenced that since November 2015. And so I'd like to talk about the twin pillars in 2002, the province adopted the water balance methodology. I will explain in a moment. Uh, but in terms of the theme for this 
two-day event. We're now developing the ecological accounting protocol as a tool to calculate the opportunity cost of drainage infrastructure. And I am intentionally putting the focus on two very pragmatic words, drainage infrastructure, because my lens, looking at things, is trying to look through the lens of local government, because that's where the decisions about what happens on the land happen, and those decisions matter. So the new paradigm, and you know what, and I have to tell you, in 2005, when we said, you know, we need to start the mind shift change, what will our sound bite be? And we didn't know how that sound bite, watersheds as infrastructure assets, would resonate. And it succeeded expectations over the last past year and a half in terms of all the presentations I've done how people kind of get it intuitively, and that's the key. People have to get it intuitively for them to buy in. And you say, okay, a watershed is an infrastructure asset. What does that mean? Well, it's an integrated system. We don't tend to think integrated. We don't tend to think integrated or in a whole systems way. We tend to silo. So what's the next step? It's an integrated system. We've got to be practical here, right? I'm an engineer. I'm a water resources engineer. Well, how does water reach the stream? Well, there's three pathways. Well, guess what? You know, in terms of how we develop, we've got to think of those pathways as the infrastructure assets. What are the three pathways? Well, obviously, yeah, there's water that flows over the land surface, but shallow horizontal interflow, that's crucial. Deep vertical, deep vertical groundwater, that's the third path. Well, those pathways of the assets, they provide water balance services. That's the key message. So kind of linking the theme of this event, bringing it down from the global word eco asset to a water balance service. That's what we're trying to accomplish. So it's, I find it really interesting because everyone learns about the water cycle in elementary school. And I'm able to relate to my four kids in terms of when they learn it and when they forget it. So we all learn it in elementary school. We all forget the basics by high school. And professionals really do forget the basics. So what we did last November, uh, or last September rather, we did release a primer called Primer on Application of Ecosystem-Based Understanding of the Georgia Basin, which was really providing an understandable language so any audience could take what we've learned over the last 20 plus years and apply that understanding and begin to implement practices that actually begin to restore the hydrologic integrity of watershed. So if you want this document, you go to waterbucket.ca, go to the page for guidance documents for resources, it's there. It's like less than 20 pages. Read it. I'm just gonna go through a quick set of guiding principles. Watershed protection starts with an understanding of how water gets to a stream and how long it takes. So, if that's the key thought, then guiding principle number one is you've got to maintain the proportion of rainwater entering the stream by each pathway. And that brings you back to the three pathways, right? Surface, interflow, deep, ground, deep groundwater. And the significance, the significance of those pathways is the time element. So if you think about how we develop, we've accelerated the time element, right? We've shortened, we've shortened the time element and that's, that's accelerating the consequence, the impacts and the consequences. So that leads to, well, what is the water balance in the East Coast and the West East Coast of Vancouver Island watershed? Guiding principle number two, understand where the water goes naturally and reproduce those conditions. Guiding principle number three, well, you gotta have some numbers, right? So if you look on an annual basis, water falling on a watershed, water that reaches the stream, this is environment Canada data, both things, how does, how, the water you see in the stream is coming via those three pathways. What jumps out at you in that table? Interflow, the water that moves horizontally through the shallow soil, 55%. That's, that's the pathway that we disrupt, disturb, eliminate, use whatever word you want, want. that's that's the pathway that we're disrupting half the flow to the stream seas. That's how it gets there. 
So when we say think like a watershed, which is the theme for this symposium, well, it's understand how a watershed, the streams, the groundwater, aquifer, sites, and people function as a whole system. And, you know, and, and Tim, you know, in your, in your presentation last night, I thought it was great that you, the imagery that you used, because I think that so often technical people really screw things up in terms of making things seem so complicated. And your presentation of just explaining the basics and the images, what more do we need to convey an understanding, right? <laughs> so in terms of the whole system's approach, use and develop land in a way that mimics the natural, and here's the key words I want you to go away with, flow duration. So think of the flow pattern in a creek. That's what we're trying to replicate, because if you do that, you reduce risk, and that risk is environmental, it's financial, you name it, you improve health, you comply with regulatory requirements. I do have to give you a couple of technical slides to prove my bona fide PDs as, as, as an engineer, and <laughs> but not too much, right? So if the desired outcome is to limit stream erosion, <clears throat> prevent flooding, and improve water quality, then guiding principle number four is replicate the flow duration pattern to mimic the water balance. So what does this graph show you here? This graph is showing you on the x-axis discharge, uh, discharge rates, and on the, on the y-axis it's saying exceeds, really what, what this is is, is, is um, uh, the, the, an analysis of the total flow record for the period of period of record. I don't know uh, whether this was Jim, whether it was 25, 30 years, yeah, 25. 25 years. So that's telling you that any, any one of those discharge rates saying that um, a, you will see a certain flow rate over the last 25 years. You will see in the case of whatever it is, seven, you'll see that 10 hours total. In, in, in that whole 25 year period. What the, what the relationship is showing you, all I, all I want to point out to you is, in terms of this flow duration relationship, the red line versus the yellow line, the red line is where you're going with the con con continued development. The yellow line at the bottom re re reflects what you could accomplish by changing the way developed land is, is developed in terms of mimicking a natural condition if you think about on an annual basis, how water flows in a receiving stream. If the desired outcome is to limit, in this case, or prevent flooding, well, if you change what you're doing in terms of mimicking the flow duration, you're gonna have an impact on the peak flow relationship. And as, a, as engineers, as a profession, we have historically overemphasized the floods because the floods are important. But when our function was, Tech people who were building a floodplain where they should have been in the first place, as you so greatly showed him with those flashback photographs, right? But you know, if you change the way you land, develop land differently, you get a different outcome. So again, look, just look at the difference in the line between the red line, which is where you're going, if you continuation of old business as usual, versus the yellow line, kind of yellow line, at the bottom where it shows, hey, you know, you uh, you can achieve the goal of reduced stream erosion by reducing flow duration and and in the process, substantially reduced flood risk. So that's, that's the benefits of doing things differently. So managing by the numbers, Wally, <laughs> your photograph. <laughs> um, so for the past decade in, B in BC, thought leaders have encouraged practitioners to think like a system rather than like an accountant. And the thinking like a system transcends just watersheds. And that's why I, I singled Wally out because in terms of asset management BC, um, as a parallel group to the Partnership for Water Sustainability, changing the way local governments think about assets, period. And, 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 get, and, and moving the focus to desired outcomes, not prescriptive methodologies, because you need to keep the focus on outcomes. And that's where we're different in British Columbia, uh, because we keep talking about the outcomes. But in terms of, of, of infrastructure, it's all about the service, not the asset. And in terms of the guiding philosophy for the BC framework, uh, it's what services are important, what is the desired level of service. That's a big shift in thinking, what's the desired level of service, and how will the services be delivered sustainably. So that's the direction that we are moving in right now in British Columbia. I'm almost done. And uh, kind of give a local context, I heard last night that uh, David Allen is the co-chair of Asset Management BC. 
and David generated a really great soundbite. The role of local government is to deliver services. The role of local government is to deliver services. Achieving sustainable service delivery is the end goal of asset management. So it's rethinking how you look at the look at that infrastructure. And you know the traditional view was, um, well, you know, once it's in the ground, you're managing managing the asset, as opposed to saying, well, should we even build the infrastructure in the first place? A different way of thinking. Uh, in terms of the, you know, this this is. This is the sustainable service delivery wheel. That's the branding for, for the BC framework. Uh, in terms of integrating the BC framework with sustainable watershed systems, we're saying, okay, in British Columbia, we're in the early stages of changing how local governments manage their core infrastructure, their roads, their sewers, their you know, water systems. So you can't expect everybody to do everything overnight. <laughs> And again, the city of Courtney is doing such a fantastic job of a, a walk in the talk in terms of applying the sustainable service delivery framework to their core infrastructure. So, you know, in the beginning, you'd have nothing. Step one, you begin to implement the, uh, the BC framework. Step two, you know, in terms of your core assets, you're now thinking holistically, and you're looking at life cycle costs, and your whole way of doing business is changing. Step three, you're ready to take on watersheds. We're not saying wait to take on watersheds. We're saying while you're tackling your core assets, you need to be moving in parallel so that a couple of years from now, maybe one year from now, you'll be ready to make that next step in terms of dealing with your drainage infrastructure and doing things differently. So local governments are moving along and <coughs> continue there at different points. My final slide. Cathedral, cathedral thinking. And it aptly describes the vision for sustainable watershed systems through asset management. And you're wondering, what is cathedral thinking? <clears throat> well, think about when cathedrals were built a thousand years ago. They took 100 years, sometimes up to 200 years. So what it meant was that when, when people started on those projects, they knew they would not see the end. They knew they would not see the end, but they still committed to doing it, and we can learn from that. So in the era of the eight-second soundbite, this is kind of an opposite end of the spectrum thinking, saying we have to think intergenerationally and, and be serious about it, because the foundation of cathedral thinking is something very pragmatic. You do have to have the far-reaching vision. This symposium is creating a vision for this valley. You do have to have a well-thought-out blueprint for action. And then you have to have a shared commitment to long-term implementation. So in this room, we won't see the end of the process. But if we set things in motion, there will be an outcome that achieves that vision.